Welcome to True Crime Morelli, episode six. This particular case, I have a fascination with. It holds a very dear spot in my heart, and this, it's one of the reasons why True Crime Morelli came to be. You can remember a hot summer night in LA in 1985. You have your windows open, your doors unlocked, you think everything is fine, and you wake up to this man in front of you yelling to swear on Satan and where's the money, where's the jewelry, and rapes you and kills you, kills your husband. Fast forward to finding out that this person's childhood was, full, was filled with trauma, deaths, lots of heavy drugs, epilepsy. It really brought fascination because whether or not you believe it, history repeats itself, and I'm sure there's a lot of people out there that have gone through that or that are going through that. What this person did was evil. He deserved his sentence, but if he would have gone a different way, if, we, if he would have had someone there to say, hey, go this path, I got you, would he have been the Night Stalker? I'm going on a trip to Arizona, to his hometown, El Paso, and along the way, I will have guests in this episode explaining the crimes, the childhood, the memories that they had with Richard Ramirez, good and bad. I really hope you guys enjoy this and my birthday gift from me to you. I'll see you guys in Disneyland. Oi. Hey guys, I'm back, True Crime Morelli. Um, I have a special guest today, which you probably know, Dylan. We did, um, <laughs> he's back, <laughs> he's back. I'm back. We did uh, Ted Bundy. And everyone, by the way, was like, when is Dylan gonna come back on another episode? They were really asking for you. So you did an amazing job, so. Thank you, everybody. You're welcome. You're welcome. You have a connection with, with <laughs> Richie. Can you, can you talk about that? Ever since I can remember, really, there's been a shadow man that's been following me throughout my life. And might as well start from the beginning. They say that the first memory that a child can uh, have and install into their mind uh, and recall later in life basically happen even before turning one year old, uh, especially if it's a traumatic uh, happening. So with that, when I was about two and a half, uh, my first memory is being put down and having a POV of my mom looking out the front door of our house. We lived in Whittier. And um, later on, as uh, I grew older, I always had this memory. I asked my mom, what is this about? And she told me that on this particular night, it was slightly drizzling and my mom would bring the dogs inside the house because my father was working graveyard and he wasn't there and it was a big house and it was just me and my mom. So she would bring in the dogs just to watch over us. And about this particular night, uh, they were muddy and stinky from being wet of the rain and whatnot. And my mom decided to leave them out. Uh, we had a pretty big backyard and it's, uh, the garage was deep within the uh, 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 area of where we lived. So our dogs would hide in deep inside the garage there uh, to shelter from rain, to sh be sheltered from the sun, whatever. That was kind of their big dog house they had. So on this particular night, my mom heard the dogs going berserk, basically. and. She picked me up, took me to the living room, and this is my memory, put me down, and she looked through the keyhole area, uh, not the keyhole, but the... Uh, the, the peeping people. hole. The peeping hole. I said peeping hole, y'all. <laughs> <laughs> and saw a tall, skinny man in black with shortish, longish hair, uh, about five feet from where our... Uh, the entrance fence to our backyard is. And this is what the dogs were going crazy over. 
She saw the man run up the street and disappear. Later on, the police came, detectives came, and uh, it turned out to be the man of the hour today, what? Richard Ramirez. No way. And so we fast forward in time. Uh, my mom wrote him uh, after he got incarcerated, obviously, in San Quentin. And she asked him, was it you that night in Whittier where we live? And he said it was. Oh my God. Okay. <laughs> but I also wrote him myself um, in the last handful of years before he died up until he died and uh, we had a little bit of a connection there uh, I didn't write him as a fanboy or I was it's just it was something that again uh, in childhood and in my teen years I had this idea that Richard Ramirez could have entered my home and I could have been a possible victim or my mom and it just was that thing where sometimes you had to face your fears you have to confront your fears yeah or else you kind of live life always wondering, you know, who was this man and all that kind of thing. So that's what I did in writing him, and that's also what Mai did when she wrote him before that. So did you ever ask Richard if that was him? Or I did, but he never replied. Uh, he just kind of kept the, well, in all his letters, he kept the dialogue very uh, friendly, uh, never got too personal, but uh, my mom had wrote him way before I did, so okay. early, mid-90s, so I, maybe... And, and female versus male, he's going to definitely <laughs> answer to a female, because we know how he is with females. Is this interest in Richard Ramirez uh, generally what got you into true crime, or have you always been interested in true crime? I have always been interested in true crime. And because my dad was has always been into that stuff, and mm. I remember being five years old, which Please don't do this to the kids, guys. <laughs> Gosh. But my dad, you know, different times. But I would watch all this killing stuff at age five with my dad, like one in the morning, just watching stuff. And I was always fascinated because the one thing that fascinates me is what goes on in a serial killer's mind when they're doing this. Mm -hmm. And how do they not have remorse after it? Or years mm -hmm. after that, when they're incarcerated. Like, the, it's just nothing to them. Mm -hmm. How can you go and murder someone and not, and like, what are you thinking? when you're doing it right and then just sit there and go eat a sandwich or you know melon with a spoon exactly like Richie would right. in people's houses you have to be sick to do that right. and that's but that's me like what goes in their mind like what right. happens and this is recommend I, by <laughs> the way do you know I was called the Oprah of true crime the oh, other man. day this is hilarious I'm, <laughs> I'm all for it so if y'all want to give me a show I'm all for it. Do I get a free car? <laughs> yes, you do. You, you get a car, and you get a car, and everyone gets a car. <laughs> <laughs> what is it about Richard Ramirez that uh, uh, piqued your particular interest in him? Well, two things. His childhood. When I read the childhood that he went through, I was like, okay, this guy at some point in his life was innocent. Didn't have any thoughts of killing anyone or hurting anyone. And then as I read it, I was like, okay, this man was literally groomed. It was, all right, I got it. And then he went through all this, you know, head traumas and mental stuff and drugs and all that. Second thing was the spiritual part of it. I, I believe I'm very spiritual and I believe in all that, the angels and demons and the good and the bad. And there is that, that part of him that has that essence of like, what did he do? Like, what, what could he have possibly summoned? Like, what was mm -hmm. he doing when no one was watching him? Mm -hmm. Right. With Richard as a childhood, I I realized that a lot of kids, because we all have gone through traumas, we've all gone through some shit. There's no one on this earth can say <laughs> I'm 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 fine. Mm -hmm. No, no, you haven't. You you're good. I connected in that level because I was like, wow. If I have I I know I have this. I know I have one person in my life right now that if I'm going south, they're gonna say, um, come here. We're gonna sit down and we're gonna figure this shit out because I'm not letting you go that path. I have that one person, and I know you do, too. He didn't have anyone. Right. For me, it's the what ifs. What if he had just one person, mm -hmm. like you said, say, mm -hmm. Richie, sit down. Mm -hmm. We're not letting you go. This, we're not, this, is, this is enough. Yeah. So that's that fascination with me. It's the what ifs. So maybe I can just buy me a damn time machine. <laughs> I can go back in time. 
So today's the day. I'm driving seven hours and 20 minutes to Tucson, Arizona. This is the first time that I'm doing my podcast on my own, producing it, shooting it. So I hope you guys approve. Um, I'm super excited and I'm going to be on this journey to meet the Ramirez. Hi, True Camarelli. Camarelli. I'm here in Arizona with the beautiful Shelly Ramirez. What is this, Shelly? This is the house I grew up in. What is the significance of this house? Um, this is where Richie was supposed to come the night that the day he was caught. Yeah. Wait, so this is what? This is where he was gonna run away? Yeah, this is where he was coming. He was on his way. Didn't make it. He got caught. The universe said, "Not today, Satan. <laughs> Not today." Not today. But this is the house. A little bit closer, cause I don't want to get caught. You know, call cops on. <laughs> nah. Not today, Richie. <laughs> <laughs> He's like, "What you bitches do?" <laughs> He's like, "What y'all doing?" But yeah, this is the I. I don't think anyone knows this. Well, here it is. I mean, it looks a lot nicer. I think my dad used to keep up with it. But yeah, it's yeah. Kind of looking a little rough. <laughs> looking a little rough. It's been like what, 37 years yeah, now? Damn. Weird. No, I we lived here when I was like eight or nine. Oh, okay. So that's been a while. But a long time ago. That's all that matters. So there it is, you guys. You guys can check it out. Oh. Say hi. Hi. <laughs> <laughs> Clearly, I'm in the middle of interviewing someone. It's an honor. Robert Ramirez, the brother of Richard Ramirez, the Night Stalker. This is awesome for me. It's, I'm, I'm happy to be sitting with you. Robert, how are you? Okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Today, I have a wonderful guest with me. I'm actually excited because you guys know this is my favorite case. So I am here with the niece of Richard Ramirez, Shelly Ramirez. Hey. And she's mad at me because I haven't fed her yet, and it's 1:30, and I'm hungry. So I'll get, I'll get you, girl. Thank you. <laughs> Try not to choke you right now. <laughs> she's gonna choke me off. <laughs> How old were you when you found out about your uncle being the night stalker? I was about, let's say, like seven or eight. Do you remember like what happened? Like, how did you find out? Did you see it on TV, on a, on a newspaper? No, um, actually we were sitting in the living room, me and my dad, we were watching TV and we were going to blow up a balloon. So I asked him, I was like, dad, will you blow up this balloon? And all of a sudden the TV's like, breaking news, breaking news. It just like cut through all the channel, you know? And That's crazy. Yeah. Could and you imagine just sitting there and like seeing your uncle on TV? Like It was insane. And my dad's reaction was insane. I will never forget it, the look on his face. It, it hit him hard, huh? Yes. It was like, yeah, his face just got pale and the look of like sadness it was really sad wow. it's crazy <laughs> i love it that's it it's crazy <laughs> do you do you miss him sometimes like yeah like, yeah 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 do you remember do you remember clearly in your head when you first saw like the whole thing go down like when he was arrested do you remember that i was in a past when he came out on on the news that they were looking for him and I couldn't believe it, so I called Nacho and told him, Richard's on TV, and he's the one that's been killing all these people over there in L.A. Were you, like, shocked? Like, was it one of those? No, no, I did Richie. <laughs> How was your connection with, with your uncle? Like, did you guys talk a lot? Did he write? Because I've, I've seen a yeah. lot of letters of him from that, and, like, he mentioned you a lot. Like, he always asked about you. Yeah, and all the letters that he wrote to my dad, he always asked for me. I noticed that, too. I was like, wow, like, different, but he did, you yeah. know, for whatever What was would he worth. ask you? Like, what was his things, like, with you? Like, um, Well, I used to write to him when I was little. You know, when he got caught, my dad would always tell me to write to him. My dad was consistently writing him. I can remember my dad being behind the, his little bar. We had a bar in the house, and he had all his liquor bottles. And, you know, he never drank it, but he was collecting them. He loved to, like, collect them. And um, he had the bar. Him and my mom, they had the bar all nice with these, you know, bottles and stuff. And, um yeah, he just, he was always writing him. He'd be listening to his music, his rock and roll music. Aww. And he'd be like, you know, write to your Theo, write to your Theo, you know, write to Richie. So I'd write him, you know, especially during my summers. And I'd be like, you know, how are you doing? What are you doing? Um, I didn't really understand what he was in jail for. Yeah. And like death to me growing up, it just, the way that it was all put out there was so different for me. You know, I was just like, what did he do? I knew it was death. But it just, it's always been It didn't weird. connect yeah, to Yeah, it was yeah. odd. So there's rumors going around that it took six years to find him. 
Six yeah. years. But didn't he, did, wasn't he known for the killings for like a year only? Or do you think that he was doing things prior to that? He didn't done, done it for a while. What? <laughs> well, <Lala. laughs> he's been doing it for, I didn't know what he was doing, but when he started taking guns and other stuff, my dad showed me the guns. They were gold-plated guns. Two gold? other, yeah, they were gold-plated guns. Two of them. Where did he get gold-plated guns from? <laughs> the handle. Yeah. Yeah, and they had an ignition on them. Oh, so they were stolen. Uh huh. Oh damn. Yeah. How did you feel about that? I didn't. I didn't know what to think. I said, "What the hell is he?" I thought he had gone to the pawn shop or. A friend of his had sold him to him, but no, time, ten, time cast, and, and it, it was him. Yeah, and and the times that he came to visit you here, did he ever give you any, like, clues that he was doing something weird? Nope, nothing. So no. what, what would you guys do when he was here? Like, what, what, was, like, what was your day? He would, he would go to a pastor coming, uh -huh. and none of us would have or nothing in the mind that he was doing that. Nothing. And Julian used to live with him in San Francisco. Yeah. Julian didn't know nothing about it. He was in the bar drinking. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. He didn't know nothing. The only reason he knew something is when his wife told him that uh, there's a picture of Richie on, on the news. Yeah. And the newspaper, and he looks a lot like him. So she called me up and told me, Robert, there's a picture of Richie, a man, and he looks exactly like him. He looks exactly like him. That's crazy. Now he goes, the thing is that it's going to get your mom or your dad sick. Yeah, they're, they're, I'm sure. Yeah. I know that the family went to, to L.A. to come get him back, and, but by that time he was, he was far gone. You know, he was he was gone with all the. I guess he was doing like five hundred dollars of cocaine a, a day. I guess. I mean, I I that's, know it was a that's lot. That's a lot. Yeah. You know. Um, I've heard. I've yeah. heard he's had yeah. a share. He had a good share of his run. You with know, stuff. he was just doing his business out there, and you know, the family wanted to come out, and it it didn't happen. It didn't. It, it, I think it was at that point he he was gone. Yeah. And his his perception of reality was just way different with all those drugs and the illness that he had. You yeah. know. And no hints, no hints of nothing that he was doing. The only time that I got a hint was from Isabel when she told me she saw that picture. Wow. So and he then that, that pinchy lady that you know, he was living with her, Richie was living with her, she, Richie told her, that lady go, the lady, you know what? The, the lady go, you know what? You look like the nice sucker. And Richie, Richie told him, no, I'm not. And the lady goes, yes, you are. He goes, and the lady, you don't have the balls to be a nice sucker. And she was sitting right next to him. Uh, she know? was wrong. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he told me, you don't have the balls to be a nice sucker. And he had given her jewelry, came here, rings. I mean, you name it, go watches and everything. Wow. And when she found out that it was Ricky, she took everything of stuff to the police department and showed it to them, and then they, oh, they asked him. Wow. Yeah. So I know the day before he got arrested, he came down to Arizona. To yeah. Get, right? What happened that day? Why I, was in, I was in Carolina. I was in Carolina. I was getting some groceries from Safeway, and when I go, when I got home, Sandy told me that Richie was uh, on the phone at the Home Depot, at the bus station. I go, is he there right now? And and she goes, I don't know. He just said he would call later. No, he got scared because the paper, remember the paper they put all that picture? Yeah. He found out, he, he bought a piece of, and he took off right away. Oh, and okay. he had about seven or eight guns with him. He left them in the storage, and you know those cabins. Yeah, in the locker. He opened yeah. one, and he put them all there. So they came and questioned me. I go, I don't know. 
I don't know where he left him. And he back, he went back, he went back. And it was a circus with me. So the, here, he saw his pictures here. Yeah. And then he went back. Yeah. Wow. Oh, they realized it was him over there in L.A. too. Because when he got back, they, they, they knew it was him. Yeah. We're in 2022, and uh, technology is advanced. I don't think he would have lasted a day here. No. He would have done that <laughs> crime the next day he would have been caught. That's right. Just saying, TikTok, TikTokers are serious. Yeah. They will find you in a heartbeat. Did you ever, like, get to see any of the jewelry that he stole? Pretty sure. Ooh! That's all. Okay. I would... <laughs> <laughs> that was like... <laughs> Gotta deal with you, that was guy. <laughs> More scary stories to tell in the dark after I this. Know, after this. <laughs> Do you think that he had done a lot more? And what they said he's done because Robert did mention that the cops were looking for him for over, for over six years I do think so yeah I do think so do you think he started doing killings in El Paso it's possible anything's really possible uh, I don't think uh, uh, Richard was moralistic in the sense where maybe I shouldn't kill him it's like if there was an opportunity I think he would take it yeah. and I think that's maybe something Miguel might have instilled in him also you know, if you see an opportunity, take it. It's about your survival. And I know he met somebody in prison as well, I think in the Philip Carlo book, some blonde-haired guy who was a Satanist and said, no, you got to live for yourself and what's good for you doesn't necessarily have to be good for other people. Because if you think about it, he came in to L.A. around 1979, 1980, and he was really quiet for like five years, and then all of a sudden, 80, 45, it was like a whole year. Of, right. To me, that doesn't add up. Doesn't add up. They claim that Jenny Vinko was the first kill. I don't think that was, I don't think that, that's true. I don't think so either. I think that's probably the first recorded kill that could be linked to him. And the police department and so on will say that was the first, but I think there's been more. And in a way to cover up their negligence to catch this guy, saying, oh no, it started with Jenny. But I, he probably was doing it before. Yeah, because, mind you guys, if y'all didn't know, I have to repeat myself, he also abducted children. That's right. Um, and right, uh, you showed me today, I think right. right on here. Yeah. He abducted in... Um, six-year-old. Yeah, a six-year-old from a bus stop at a school. In during the, the day. During the day, he had balls, sir. He, you had balls. So... On top of all those, because at that time there was also a lot of kids missing and getting right. kidnapped. He didn't kill any of them that we know of. And then you have all these cases that came out of nowhere. Like, and, and they also said there was like nine other cases that they, they think that they were like linked to him. Right. Do you think that they would ever find out if he did it? Or they just kind of sweep it under the rug and continue on? I think if somebody made it their business that had uh, access to certain files for... Uh, let's say the police department of Monterey Park, Whittier, and the surrounding areas where it was his hunting ground. I think maybe you could link uh, things here and there. But, it, but talking about the uh, child abductions, it also uh, brings up what we were talking about earlier, uh, off camera, which is that uh, he was a stalker. Yeah. He just wasn't some guy that uh, randomly throughout all his uh, crimes just picked a house and said that yeah. one. Yeah. And what really uh, solidified my feelings about that are the child abductions. Because there's no way he was going to drive around at 2 a.m., point at a house, <laughs> and to point out a window and say, there's a little kid in there. No. I'm just going to open this one window and abduct the kid. If you match that with the uh, abduction spot we saw earlier, yeah. he was doing that during the day. The, the six-year-old girl was looking, uh, well not looking, she was waiting for her sister to pick her up at the bus stop. During the day, he picked her up, put her in a bag, and took off. So he was definitely driving around schools, yeah. stalking children, yeah. and possibly uh, following these kids' homes later in the night, coming back 
to where their bedroom would be and abducting them. That that makes total sense. And the same with the with the victims. Absolutely. I don't think he was just driving around saying this yellow house. It has to be a no. specific kind of person. No, I think he would during the day come out, hang out because there has been what I've read, um, especially with Sophia Dickman. There was an article I read that prior to that incident, they had seen a man That's right. describing him, you know, as Richie walking around the backyard in that area. That's right. And you know, it looked like he w he was kind of jumping around and, and like looking kind of shady, suspect in mm -hmm. that area. So I definitely think that he would go around. And also, we've been to the locations, especially the ones by so uh, Sophie Dickman and Joyce. Oh, it's yeah. weird to yeah. get to. Yeah. So he definitely stalked them out. Yeah. It, and for those who haven't been to the Monterey Park area, the map in which he did these uh, uh, crimes, the victims are very close to each other. And it's this labyrinth of, of, uh, of suburban, suburban homes, cul-de-sacs, that if you didn't know where you were going already, just to randomly pick a house would be kind of crazy. But it also goes back to the Inside Edition interview with Martin Kipp, where he says, he says it himself, he would stalk these people during the day. Yeah. This is what Richard told him. So it all adds up. Also, the fact that, I mean, like me and my mother, when uh, he came to our house, we were uh, potentially uh, a great uh, uh, target for him. Being that my mother was young and beautiful, I was a little kid. Now, as we read uh, in his crimes, he would attack a woman and use almost the child as leverage yeah. so that she could submit yeah. to Richard's demands in fear that he would hurt the child. So yeah. I'll, me and my mom were perfect for that, yeah. actually. He definitely must have stopped you guys out. Which is That's crazy. insane. Yeah. And it's, uh, there's a lot of people glorifying his crimes, which I don't know why you would glorify yeah. his crimes. Or there's, uh, there's people out there who actually support his actions, which, listen, to each their own. But also, also think about the victims, what they went through. Because, oh, this is another thing. You know, a lot of people out there are like, oh, yeah, Richard. I'm like, if you would have met Richard in 1984 um, downtown, you know, Los Angeles Street at three in the morning, I don't think you would have been like, oh, Richard, you would have ran. That's right. You would have ran. Or if you're, you know, woken up to someone right in your face saying, shut up, bitch, where's the money? I don't think you'd be, like, romanticizing this man. That's right. It's, it's different things. People don't know from reality, like, the perception is just weird. So we got to think of how the victims feel and how the family of the victims feel to this day. Absolutely. I've had somebody close to me murdered in a very similar way broke in, stabbed like 50 plus times with a, a screwdriver. I mean, just horrific. And when I heard news that my friend died like that, it was one of the most ugly and terrible feelings I've ever felt in my life. And I can't even imagine what the victims of, of someone that actually was family to die like that. I just can't even comprehend the horror that they felt. And uh, if you're going to touch base on Richard or anything like that, it should be for the edu educational uh, purpose of it. Yeah. So that this kind of horror and tragedy doesn't happen again. Yeah. If it can be prevented, by all means, you know, at least hopefully. Uh, I think the end game for a podcast like this is uh, just one person. Just one. So have you met um, any of the surviving victims or... I did. I met Bill Carnes. Um, he he had a really sad story. It was awful to hear. My sympathy went out to him for what happened. I was like, yeah. gosh, like something, you know, it makes you think, you yeah. know, because my uncle wasn't innocent. What he did, he did. <laughs> <laughs> he did it. How did you guys handle all this? Do you remember how it, it all, like, how was it for the family, like dealing with that? The, all the cameras and the reporters and the police and like how was I that? remember it when I was little I can remember like the cameras when we were walking and my mom like put your head down put your head down you know yeah and there was just like flashing and my mom and dad were holding me making sure I was okay but yeah I just I remember mainly what I can remember of it all is the whole part where we're like you know, just in the courtrooms and like little pieces, bits and pieces of certain 
points of it, you know. Yeah. Would he ever look back at you guys? Do you remember him like turning around? Yeah, yeah, I do. Yeah, I can remember him. I remember my grandma, my grandpa, my tío Julian. Um, I can remember who was there. That's crazy. Yeah, crazy. I would have been my there. My dad. My I would have been in jail. I'm just letting you know because I've been screaming. Anyways, <laughs> did you go see him when he first uh, get caught in the trial? I went to about 20 trials of him. And did he ever like notice you in the in the court? Did he ever say hi to yeah. you? Yeah. 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 Hey. <laughs> <laughs> Do it again, Dad. Yeah. Yeah. Do it again. So, I didn't get it. That yeah. was Richie in court for Robert. <laughs> mm. Yeah. Oh, and yeah. um, he was mad. And you saw where he put the pentagram. Were you there when he yes. did that? Yes. Yeah, we were there. I was there. What did you do? You were like, no, Richie. No, my dad had already told him, don't do that because you're gonna, they're gonna find you guilty. And no, there he goes, putting the telegram on, on the hand. And he flashed the pentagram. Did you guys were like, oh no? No, I just said to myself, what the hell is he doing now? <laughs> What could possibly, what else can he be doing right now? Yes. yes. Hell Satan, hell Satan. Oh my God. <laughs> and you know what's so crazy, Kim? When, she, when he was going to, to the court, those high priests from Satan. Yes, uh huh. They came and they were high. They were all dressed in black with all the girls. Wow. Honest, I never had seen nothing like that. That's crazy. You would have laughed. You would have, wow. <laughs> wow. I'm like, mm. what? Is this a movie? What am I doing here? <laughs> it's a movie? Did yeah. you ever meet um, his wife, Doreen? Did you ever meet her? Yeah, yeah. What did you think of her? I don't know. I think she uh, was there for the show. So she never really loved Richie? I don't think so. No. I don't think so. He just yeah. wanted to be a groupie. Yeah. And then the guards and the, and the people in the court, when he would come out, the guards would tell him to take off his glasses and he wouldn't take them. Yeah. He wouldn't take them off. The one the, the trial, right? You know, and they said that he looked scary without the glasses. <laughs> no, put him back on. Put him back on. <laughs> Do you think he did all the crimes? Do you think there's some crimes he didn't commit? Because th those are a lot of big talks. Mm -hmm. What do you think? I think he did a majority of them. Um, in some of the cases, there are things that are very iffy. Yeah. And it's just not my perspective. It's the perspective of even the people involved in court, as you look back in the trial. Um, but I would also say there's a lot more out there uh, that he probably did. He will always be a mystery yeah. in that sense. And I think that's why a lot of people <laughs> Are interested in that's in what it is. That. That's another reason that like, he's a mystery. Like everything mm -hmm. around him is just like ooh, and you're like, but what's the right. ooh? Tell right. me. Right. <laughs> Knowing he he was in jail for all the crimes because he got co co convicted for a lot, and there was more that they tried to put on him. And you know my feelings on that because I think a lot of those crimes that they, I don't know, some of them weren't his. I believe. Do you think he did those crimes? Do you think they did all of them? Do you think that he was guilty of all of them, or there were some that were like. Mm, I think he did a lot of them. I think he yeah. did probably most of them. Yeah. I mean, for them to be able to convict him, they had to have some strong evidence. She said what she said. For those <laughs> out there saying that he's innocent, no. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, he wouldn't have been in jail if he was innocent. This is facts. She said what she said. And that thing is, when we went to visit him the first time, me, Rosa, Julian, all of us, when they didn't want it to let us in. And then I said, why? The captain required for us to take a picture of all of you. Oh, wow. Before you even visit him. They wanted to make sure. Yeah, they go before. And that thing, I wasn't there. I wasn't there, but Rosa and Julian were there. Somebody here to visit Mr. Ramirez, a night tracker. In the hallway, I was, the room was all full and they all kept quiet. Wow. Yeah. So you saying that when you went to see them, they asked a picture for all of you? Yeah, before we even get to see him. And then he was complaining to us that they were putting medication on his food. Oh, like poisoning him. Uh-huh, they were putting medication on his food. 
I go, Richie, they're not doing nothing. You wrote him a lot. Yeah, I wrote him a lot of letters. Yeah, did you ever go see him? Well, check this out, Kim. I went, I was, got all ready for Morancy. I got Charlie, Jackie, and Tendi all ready. We were, I went and rented a car. Mm -hmm. We go down there when they had him not in St. Quinn, but in the LA County Jail. In the LA County. And I go there and I call his name. I told him that I came to visit him. And uh, the jailer comes out. He's not coming out. I go, whoa, I just drove all the way down here for what? And he goes, one of the jailers got him mad. And when he was putting his straight in, Richie got him and broke his arm off. Wow. Yeah, because you know, Richie was, Richie was up with him. He goes, you can see him. He broke the arm of one of the uh, guards. I think it was a lieutenant or lieutenant or something. And then when they did that, they took away the plate and then they called the, what are those people called that come inside like gladiators? Yeah, the and, big guards of the, And yeah. Richie would tell them, fuck you, come in. <laughs> no, pues estaba bien guapo, él se creía bien guapo. <laughs> he, would, he would get the mattress and cover himself with the mattress when they were hitting him. <laughs> that one I've never heard, so you're welcome. <laughs> yeah, they would, they would, so often they would go, you would tell them, come in. I mean... <laughs> He wasn't wow. afraid of them. He was not having it in prison. No, uh, he got the mattress and the pillow, whatever he could put, and block himself for, you know, they hit you with a baton. Yeah, they hit you. But you wouldn't, they wouldn't do nothing. Yeah. It's, it's mind-boggling to me because a lot of people have a lot to say about you and your family when they don't know yeah, who you are. they do. And it's upsetting because now we're going to get into it a little bit. Um, and. To be honest, Shelly, I'm going to kind of pour my heart out to you. Start singing out of nowhere. <laughs> <laughs> um, one of the reasons why the, I did the podcast was because my fascination with this case and wanting to put the truth out there of, of Richie. You know, yeah. and what, what made him be this way? And there's a lot of documents and stuff out there, you know, explaining that he was not normal. He had a lot of mental issues and with the epilepsy and the traumas that he went through and the, the hard drugs that he was doing. Like, it, 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 it would be a miracle, Shelly, if your uncle did not turn out. A, a, right. A, you know yeah. what I'm saying? He already has so, been through too much. Exactly. To be very straightforward, Richie's case was one of the reasons why I created, I wanted to do the podcast. Right. Because... I was like, I need Richie's story to be told truthfully. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of Richard's story has been half truth, a lot of lies. The media portrayed him differently than right. what he really was. And they never even touched the surface until tonight with a documentary about right. his childhood. That's right. And it's like, well, Ted Bundy got his childhood. Why can't we not talk about Richard's? What's right. going on with Richard that no one wants to talk about? That's right. Because you don't want to feel bad for him because eventually he, w you know, he was an innocent kid at one point. You yeah. know, and I, I want that for every serial killer that I talk about. I want to touch base on what happened. Right. What happened because, like, we were just talking. Right. You know, there could be someone going through it right now. Yeah. One thing, Shelly, is that the media has always been half truth when it comes to Richie and the Night Stalker case. Like, it's never been 100% true. It's never been 100 It's just been, this is what we got, and this is what we're going to show you, and that's that. And I think that it's time that Richie gets the truth, the real truth out there from the family, you know, it's just, why keep hiding it? They yeah. never talk about his childhood. They never, like you see Ted Bundy and they talk about Ted Bundy to the T. Mm -hmm. Why not Richie? I don't know. I mean, that's a good question. I mean, I'd want to know the answer to that too. Why, why people try to kind of hide his stuff? Mm -hmm. Like, what is it about him that people are just like, is it because people will, uh, will maybe feel bad about him? And they I don't want, so. You yeah, know? and he was a human. He was innocent at some point in his life. He was. You know and what I'm saying? And then he just and then things to the dark. Yeah, the darks. Check this out, Kim. We <laughs> we were in the freeway. Mm -hmm. We're in the freeway, and a cop stopped. Uh, the cop, the, I don't know, the tail light or something was was out, and Richie got out, and the 
cop got his dog. It was a Saint Bernard, and he smelled pot. Oh no! He was smelled pot, and Richard got mad and killed that dog with his hands. No. Yes. No. Yeah, they charged him with something, killing an officer or something. Richard killed a dog. Oh my goodness. Yeah, yeah. He was like that, good man. How how old was he? It was an eighteen or nineteen. Wow! So yeah. he, when he got angry, he got angry. Yeah, and that's not it. One time, one time, my mom and Rosa went to his apartment to talk to him to settle down. He was so pissed off. He got the TV and threw it through the window where my mom and Rosa were coming. Oh my God! <laughs> Get the hell out of here! Wow, and that was here in Arizona. No, in El Paso. In El pa wow. Yeah, my, my dad couldn't put up with it. So you he want, had. You want, you want me to tell you something? <laughs> yeah, tell me. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm here. Mm. I'm all ears. He was when I came, when I when I came to Morante, Nacho, because I got in trouble myself. I got in trouble, so I went back to El Paso, and Rosa told me that Nacho and Richie were fighting. It was a party, it was his graduation. Yeah. And I asked Rosa, what's wrong? Richie got mad with Nacho, I go, why? Because Richie put the moves on Becky, and, Be and Nacho got mad, and he came to the house with a knife, and was going to tore Richie, tore Richie, you fuck with her again, I'm gonna fucking kill you. That was natural. Wow. Damn. Yeah. He goes, you, you tell her something else and I'm gonna kill you. And I went out there and we saw what I did out there and I told Nacho, Richie, you're gonna have to settle down. You're gonna drive mom and dad <laughs> crazy. So he was, a, he was a crazy, he was a crazy teenager. And he, he, he stopped, he stopped. He took off out of the party. Yeah. He was a crazy. Is it true that he showed up to El Paso in a limousine? Yes. And no one suspected anything. Nothing. <laughs> Did he, he have girls in the limo? No. Or just him? Just him. He used to be, he used a movie star. <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> yeah. And your mom didn't say anything. They're like, wait, what is he doing with the limo? No one My said anything. My dad is the one was that, you know, because he was a cop. Yeah. And he suspected something about it. He goes, this is not right. And my, I was sitting out there with a, on the porch with him. Yeah. And and he showed me the guns. He showed me, this is what Richie gave me. And I said, oh, wow, they're classy. That's the gold ones, right? Yeah. Wow. And then one time, Carmen, Richie was at the house, and he was smoking pot, and my dad got mad, and they got into a big argument, and Richie, I don't know what Richie told him, he blew his head off, and my dad got mad, and Richie ran, and my dad went after his gun. He had it under the mattress, yeah. in between the mattress, and he couldn't he couldn't get it in time to shoot him because Richie ran out the back door. And Richie was fast. Uh-huh. Yeah, he went out the back. He never, my dad never caught up with him. But if he would have, he would have shot him. Oh, he was a troublemaker. Yeah, he would have shot him. I just want to say, Shelly, you are respected. You are validated. I know a lot of people judge you and your family because of, of what sure. Richie did. Yeah. And that doesn't make you a killer right. or the family. Right. It was just one that came out the wrong way and, you know, because of circumstances and the environment and whatever else it was, you know, it's not your fault. It's not your family's fault. Yeah. I mean, can't control what you know, someone else is going to do. You know, he was not right. He was mentally ill. That, that he should have been taken care of more and maybe watched more with the illnesses that he had as a kid and the, maybe, because right. maybe that could have helped. I mean, back in the day, it was never like that. You know, they never had that kind of stuff. But yeah, yeah. I mean, there had to be some kind of incident that maybe none of us know about, none of, you know, that, but 
maybe his siblings knew about that they saw prior yeah. to any of us being born that they could have said, hey, something's off with Richie. Yeah. Like, he's not okay. We need to get him in some kind of program. We need to see what's out yeah, there for him. Yeah, no one did. No one did that. I mean, someone to talk to. Someone, I mean, all of them together and nobody could, like, you know, I mean, that's just ignorance. And that's what I'm saying. Like, someone could have helped and they didn't. And that was the consequences. Um, he went the wrong path. Well, okay, so what is it different about Richard Ramirez and all the other serial killers that attracts you about him be being that he's the one you're most, you know, uh, interested in? Is there a difference between Richard, Ted Bundy, Gacy? What do you think it is? It's the, it's the combination of his, when he was a kid, combination with the drugs, combination with the traumas that he went through, combination of being groomed. Mm -hmm. And the combination of that spiritual uh, that spiritual thing that I was telling you about versus you know Ted Bundy you know Ted Bundy you know Ted Bundy didn't have a really really bad bad childhood I mean he was lied to mm -hmm. and he went to college he graduated mm -hmm. he worked he was in, in politics he had a lot of opportunities he had a lot of, and he took them all mm -hmm. he decided that he just wanted to go that path versus Richard grew up in poverty mm -hmm. had a lot of mental issues was neglected ended up in drugs mm -hmm. ended up with a crazy cousin grooming him to be a killer, and he ended up that route. Mm -hmm. And then he started believing in Satanism and believed that Satan, is, Satan was the one that was kind of protecting him from, you know, from mm -hmm. everything else while he was doing his crimes. Because he was in the book, in Philip Carlos book, which by the way I keep saying is 75% true, 25% bullshit. Mm -hmm. But in the book, he would, before he would enter a victim's house, he would say a prayer. Or he would say, you know, I'm sacrificing this for you. Okay. Like, he would give that. So he felt like he was powerful with that. That's interesting to me. What happened in his life? Did he summon something when he was a kid? Did he see something that he was like, this is it? This is what, I, what is it? And that what is, like I said earlier, is what keeps me right. researching. Right. 